Good morning. Well, this year is almost done. Thank God. And that's my feeling. Well, welcome to the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. I love this place. It's a religious community that doesn't claim to have all the answers. And that's what I love about it. And uh, instead, we try to guide our lives with these uh, seven principles. And we know of a lot of these principles, like, you know, the uh, respect for, or, or, well, I don't know them that well, let me tell you. <laughs> I, we just added one about racism, which is a good thing. But there's three that we don't pay much attention to. I just want to mention them to you. Justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. And a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. This is my spiritual home. And from all the faces I see out here, it's a spiritual home for most of us. But I do want to say that there are a lot of people I don't see here. They're probably joining us online, right? And I want to say good morning and welcome to you as well. Um, my name is Ken Ralph, and I'm a worship associate. And I'm joined with two other worship associates this morning, Kira Zecker and Gary Welterlin. And uh, not only that, but we have a whole team of musicians here. Larry Williams has been our music director, and he's put together all the musical elements of our service. And then he's joined, I won't go through all the names, but we have singers, you'll see them all, and a lot of help with other musicians as well. We're here this morning because our ministerial staff did this amazing, exhausting job of presenting three Christmas Eve services last Sunday. So it's a tradition around here that we give them a break. We give them a Sunday off and we take care of everything. And I like that, that's a lot of fun to do. So please, we're gonna make mistakes. We're not professionals. But I think we have an important message that we want to share with you this morning. Um, I also want to make a special welcome to anybody who's visiting with us today. You'll notice in your order of service, there's a yellow card. If you're so moved, give us a little information about yourself. Drop it in the basket when we're doing our collection later. We'd love to get to know you and uh, would love to see you come back again. Uh, similarly, if you're joining online, uh, just put it into the chat box, a little information about you. And here's another thought. These cards have room for more than just information. If you're going through something that's particularly difficult, put it down, share it, and uh, we can reach out to you. Uh, this goes with uh, online as well. Put it in the chat box. We'd like to know who you are and that includes the good things and the bad things. And uh, you you're safe to share them here with us. Um, oh, there's one more thank you I want to do uh, this morning. Whenever we prepare these services, there's somebody you probably don't even realize is doing this. But outside, we have a uh, wayside pulpit, that reader board out there. And every Sunday, we have a different message. And uh, this morning, the message if you hadn't read it, is if you're going through hell, don't stop. <laughs> and I love this. And uh, thank you, thank you to Ellie Grogan, who puts up those messages every, every week for us. And she came up with this. I was so taken, I encouraged her to uh, bring more like this. Let's see what she comes up with. All right. Okay, we really, this is amazing. We have no announcements, but I do want to put out a big, huge thank you to Peter Hale and Gary Welterlin. Here, I think you were a pivotal part of this too. The pancake breakfast last Sunday morning. 
which what I think was a resounding success. I had a great time. It was so wonderful to be together in that way. I hope we do it more often than just once a year. Uh, that was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Peter was a guy. Okay, so let's get started. We'll take a breath. Let it out. And let the sound of our gong connect us as we get centered and let go of the outside world for just this hour. Teresa McCracken, come up, please. Where is Teresa? I've asked Teresa, in, in standing in for her mom, Catherine, who was unable to join us today, uh, to light the chalice. Okay. Our reading today is from John Lubbock. What we do, what we do see depends mainly on what we look for. In the same field, the farmer will notice the crops, the geologist, the fossils, botanists, the flowers, artists, the coloring, and hunters, the cover for the game. Though we all may look at the same things, it does not follow that we should see them. Good morning. Hi, I'm Kier Zecker. I'm also a member of your worship arts team. And this is commonly the time in our service, right after the chalice lighting, that we take a moment to lift up something hopeful that we've seen out in the world, in the community, or in us, that has given us hope. And we've, we call this, we've called this this year the change for good jar. And we initiated this element of our service in January 2020. We first called it the Good Things Jar. In 2021, we called it the Love and Justice Jar. 2022, it was the Hope Jar. And then this year, it's been the Change for Good Jar. So for the past four years, regardless of the name we've called it, and we've taken the time to look for something, someone, or some action that we found inspiring during the week and to name it. And we encouraged all of you to think of your personal entry and to either write it down on our, in our physical change jar in the chat or talk about it with each other out in coffee hour. Um, so we're, we're wondering how many of you have done this over the past four years? Some of you, okay. How about this last year? Have you done it this last year? Anyone practice this? Okay. Okay, so, so why have we taken the time, every service to do this? Uh, some of the reasons we've called out are for it to uplift our spirit, for it to bring hope for the future. It reminds us there's always people out there moving us towards this love and this beloved community. It reminds us that the natural world finds a way to live. It reminds us of our own ability to witness lightness, beauty, gratitude, wonder, if we open our eyes and hearts to seeing this good. And I like how fellow worship associate uh, Peter Hale, he described his experience as, he said, the jar takes on more importance as time goes on. Our world is the sum total of all our actions, however minute you think they are. And we're looking for good things because they count. I really like that. 
So has this practice of holding up something inspiring made a difference to you? Or has it been in time and service maybe you haven't paid much attention to? Maybe it's something you've practiced outside Sundays and it's helped in some way. Well, this service is about highlighting some of the joys you've added to the jar. You're going to hear from three of us up here, uh, from Ken and Gary. And we're going to reflect on this practice of lifting up the good and how it showed up in our lives this year. So in the aspiration of moving us towards more harmony in the world, Larry Williams and others are going to sing good songs. Good morning to all of you. Can ask me to uh, provide happy music for you this morning. And so we will do that. We're going to begin this one. I in, in, uh, recruited Ken uh, Beiser to provide banjo because there really is no happier instrument than a banjo. So please rise, we're gonna sing hymn number 10, 10 in your teal hymnal. Please rise as you are able as we sing the hymn. It's on. Okay. <laughs> um, for the story for all ages today, I don't see any little ones, but if you are little, you can go ahead and stay in your seats. We're going to do a little game that requires you to look at slides that are going to be up on the wall. So um, hopefully you're in a spot where you can see those slides. Um, if not, you can move a little closer. Okay, um, we're going to play with two concepts, perception and judgment. Um, we all have our way of perceiving the world, and so let's look at the first slide. What do you see? Butterflies. That was, <laughs> you had a bonus one in the start. <laughs> Awesome faces, butterfly. Let's keep going. How about that one? Uh, face, chalice, face, and a chalice. Okay, great. Let's look at the second one. What do you see? Ducks, rabbits, bunnies. Great. Okay, how about the third one? What do you see first on the third one? Uh, mermaids, birds, maybe shells. Nice. A 
Okay, the fourth one. How many legs are on this elephant? <laughs> huh. Huh. That's a good one. Yeah. I've never seen that one. It's a turtle. <laughs> So our way of perceiving the world, even though we're looking at the exact same images up here, we often have very different views um, of the way we see things, the way we hear things, the way we read things. Uh, let's look at judgment next. Okay, this is how you evaluate. And on the next four slides, we're gonna leave one up. We're gonna leave the slides up for five seconds. We won't have you call out. Um, just do your best with the limited information to answer the question, this, the same question, is this a good thing or a bad thing? So we're going to run through the slides. Cool. Uh, was that easy? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe you saw um, more than one way of perceiving these images. Uh, judgment refers to the way we make decisions after we analyze and evaluate all these different perspectives. And so how does this relate to how and why we choose good things to hold up here? Well, the communal congregational entries we've spotlighted for this change for good jar come from the lens of our eight principles. So we ask the question, does this change for the world align and move, for, move us forward with our shared values of a more beloved community? And what we'll explore further today is what is your personal lens for choosing what you consider good? Yeah, it's time. Yeah, order service. Our first song, and anybody, what? I don't know if the, if the, oh, that's right. Yes. Um, we hold you in our hearts as you go, as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go. We have to do that whether there are people here under the age of 18 or not. <laughs> here's, here's a song that's a classic. When, when he said a happy song, this is what popped into my head. It goes like this. Two, three, four. That little old ant think he'll move that rubber tree plant. Cause everyone knows that an ant can't break a rubber tree plant. But he's got high hopes, so he's got high hopes. He's got high hopes. Instead of letting go, just remember that and Well now, oops, there goes another rubber tree Oops, there goes another rubber tree oh, Oops, there goes another rubber tree plant When troubles call and your back's to the wall There's a lot to be learned That wall could fall well now, once there was a silly old ram Thought he'd punch a hole in the dam No one could make that ram scram He just kept button that dam Cause, Cause he's got high hopes so he's got high hopes He's got Feeling bad instead of feeling 
Frankfurt said, just remember that ram will lose their goals a billion kilowatts. Oops, there goes a billion kilowatts. Oops, there goes a billion kilowatts. Damn. Cause we've got high hopes. So we've got high hopes. We've got high hopes. High hopes. High hopes. All your problems are just toy balloons. They'll be bursting soon. They're just bound to go pop. Well, now there goes another problem curve. Whoops, there goes another. Somebody gets to start off. Good morning and happy new year. There you go. Well, I don't know about you, but 2023 was one of those memorable years for all the wrong reasons. Everywhere you turned, everywhere you turned, there wasn't a lot of good things going on. Bad things happening in the world, sadness, very little joy, and a lot of worry for the future. One more day. I can't wait for it to be over. Yet, there was quite a bit of joy, warmth, and kindness if you only looked at last year's events on an oh-so-slightly different angle. Just like in the pictures, if I change perspective a wee bit, I can see the light glowing in the darkness. Personally, that gave me a sense that there is goodness out there. And looking back, here are a few embers that glowed brightly in the last year for me. Being short. Robert Wright wrote recently that after 60s, we lose a half of height every five years. Now, considering Robert Wright is 77 and is 4'11 when he was younger, he should be about 4'9 and a half. This should put me at under 5'7", and feeling quite height challenged in a world that appreciates tallness. However, it has proven to be quite an advantage when traveling in coach for more than six hours. And another reason, according to, to Rick Steves, to keep on traveling. This one's for Glenn Batchelor. Being left-handed. One in five of us are left-handed. We are an un underprotected class that has to learn to survive in a world designed for right-handed people. So we have to be careful when we're using power tools or swinging golf clubs that were designed by right-handed people. However, if you aspire to be President of the United States, your odds are greatly improved. Since 1945, seven of the 14 presidents were left-handed. In a 19, uh, 2019 Journal of Neurosurgery article, Nathan Selden argued that since left-handed people are right hemisphere dominant individuals, this might make presidents more effective leaders or at least more effective political candidates. Unfortunately, none of the likely presidential candidates are left-handed in 2024. Too bad, we need one. In the meantime, I plan to be careful with power tools and hope to improve my golf game. Family. This could have been a trying year for me with the passing of my mom, my son Gordon's ongoing incarceration, and my brother's health issues. Change is inevitable, and most of it is not for the good. On the other hand, I had a lot to be joyful for. My mom's celebration of life allowed our family to return to our roots in New England and have John, Joan's great-grandchildren experience how she lived where she grew up. Our daughter Greta and grandchildren, Ella and Kit, went back to Cape Cod, heard stories about Greta's vacations spent at Grammys. I was able to connect with long-term friends and family, many of them older and whom I may never see again. My brother's health has turned around and with lots of work and a positive trend. 
We have become closer through this, realizing finally that we have much more in common than we have differences. And Gordon, we continue to be close, if not closer. We talk twice a week and video call twice a month. He is one course away from completing his AA degree in the spring. He is upbeat, knows we love him, and that he is not alone. Our health. Somebody once told me that after 60, health-wise, it's patch, patch, patch. For me, it was 70. A year ago, I found myself in the Goleta Valley emergency room with shortness of breath and a pretty extensive blood clot in my left leg. Fortunately, it was found before it became worse, and with the help of modern medicine, was resolved over time. In fact, I just went back to the doctors last week and they gave me the all clear that I don't have to take blood thinners anymore. Yay. The silver lining in all of this is reinforced by the fact that at 71, I am no longer impervious to aging and that I need to take every day, as Julia says, as the day we are given. It is signal that it is time to let go of the things that are no longer relevant and embrace the things that count most. Time now is the most precious of commodities, and I spend it on what means the most to me and go, go of the things that count for less. Last year, I also took a step to make sure my mental health continued to be positive. I began to see a therapist to help me focus on relationships and being the best person I can be. It was a reminder that skills that got you this far are not always the same skills you need in the future. And so we don't, since we don't get a redo, I need to get it right the first time. Community. In September, the worship committee reviewed the Christmas calendar and suggested that there wasn't a need for a Christmas Eve morning service. There were three that evening. Peter Hale said, let's offer a pancake breakfast instead, and I'll lead the effort. Not thinking clearly, I said, I'll help out. <laughs> Two weeks prior to Christmas, I asked Peter, so uh, what's the plan? And his answer to me was, I'm working on it. Well, the pancakes breakfast started that morning at 8 a.m. And, natu and naturally took to tasks that needed to be done. Soon we had a dozen people setting up chairs, tables, manning the grill, flipping pancakes, and grilling bacon. We're still missing four pounds of bacon, meanwhile. If you find it, let us know. <laughs> at nine, the doors opened, and the first of over 60 people arrived to hot coffee and breakfast. What a terrific crowd. Young families, singles, and many older familiar faces. It was such a great event, it would have made Julia proud. At 11, after Parish Hall and the kitchen was secured, Peter sat on the, st on the stage step with his eyes closed. He had been like a duck on a lake, looking calm and placid above the surface, while frantically all the while churning his legs below, trying to stay afloat, making it look easy for everyone who attended. Thank you, Peter. And lastly, work. I've been working with a young family of more than three years to help them purchase their first home. Over that time, we had written over a dozen unsuccessful offers. Each was one emotional disappointment after another. In a week before Thanksgiving, we wrote an offer that was finally accepted and had a plan for them to be at home at Christmas. All was in place. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, just about everything went wrong. What was supposed to be a quick three-week close turned into six weeks for us of ups and downs, with each day becoming a new adventure. But a good thing happened. The sellers, the seller's agent, the escrow officer, all jumped in to help, above and beyond help, determined to get them in before the first of the year. They moved mountains to keep the process moving and overcoming all the obstacles in the way. Mostly, everybody was patient, thoughtful, and kind. On December 29th, last Friday, we got the word that the sale had been recorded and his family will be in their new home to celebrate the new year. People don't cry when they buy a house. They cry when they buy a home. <laughs> Finally, Friday, we all did. That's what makes this world so joyful. 
You know, the more I look back on last year, there are a lot of good moments. I guess 2023 maybe wasn't quite as bad as I thought it was, and maybe we should keep it going a little bit longer. Thank you. Okay, it's this uh, time in our service where we pass the plate. Um, and we do this with an affirmation of gratitude to giving, which is one of my favorite parts of a service every Sunday. But before we do the affirmation, and before I tell you where this collection is going, I pulled a couple of things out of that change jar, and I wanna share them with you. One, that we saw a resurgence of the labor movement in this past year that I have not seen in my lifetime since I grew up as a little kid with my union dad and our union family. This is really gratifying to me. Also, another good thing that I pulled out of there was that Donis and Peter welcomed a grandson into the world. Dorian, this is good news. And I'm wondering out here, who else has welcomed a grandchild into the world in this past year? Yes, two, three, hands going up. It's lovely. Good things continue to happen. Okay, well, our collection this morning is going to BLUU. You'll see it in your order of service. This is Black Lives Matter, uh, UU, Unitarian Universalist. And this organization is doing great work to try to expand our knowledge of our own racism uh, in our own lives and, uh, and to find ways to reach out and make this a more equitable and, and, and fair world. So please give generously. Um, okay, the affirmation of gratitude and giving should be printed in your order of service and it's up here. Let us be grateful when we are able to give for many do not have that privilege. And let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. And let us be grateful even for our needs so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Good morning. He is to encourage the congregation to join us in singing. And this morning, I'm going to attempt to do that by teaching you all how to scat. So we're going to learn this song, and I'm going to help you get into the mood. You know, as an anatomist, uh, you've probably all heard about the vagus nerve. It runs down your neck, down, and, and carries everything into your body, and it provides nerves to your larynx, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And you may or may not believe in the beneficiary effects of vagal stimulation. And you do that, you get that by singing, uncaring what you sound like. It's just a matter of getting the chords to vibrate. So we want you to join us today and get your vocal chords vibrating. Goes like this. to go to go
might wanna sing a note for note. Don't worry, I'll be happy. In every life there have some trouble. When you worry, it makes it double. But don't worry, I'll be happy. Yeah, get them going now once more. Lay your head, somebody came and took your bed, don't worry, I'll be happy. Well, your landlord say your rent is late, and you just might have to litigate. Well, don't worry, I'll be happy. Let it out now. I'll be, be happy. happy. Cause when you worry, you know, your face will frown and you know that's just gonna bring everybody down. So don't worry. I'll be, be happy. happy. One more time. Please don't take this too seriously that I'm up here. <laughs> uh, we just wanted to give you a little more visual interest and not all speak from the lectern. Uh, hi. Okay, if you ask me how 2023 was for me, I'd say, so good. And then I'd think, oh no. Now you're gonna ask me, what happened? Why was it so good? Because nothing drastically life-changing happened to me this year I would consider either good or bad. Like a big tree in the forest content to grow another ring, or like my thriving monstera plant content to cheerfully put out another leaf. I've had thousands of what I'd call good little moments of living and growing to get to the end of this year. I'm happy, I'm at peace, and I'm grateful for this time that I can say I feel that way. And then my mom calls last week and she asks, do you think 2024 will be the year you meet someone? <laughs> My stomach sinks a little bit because I, I know I'm taking it from her viewpoint that life is better with a love partner. And for those of you who don't know, I'm single and I've been out of romantic relationship for the longest time in my adult life for the last almost four years. And I know intellectually that my mom's just projecting with her inquiry and it comes from a place of caring. But still, when she gets on that topic, it makes me worry that I'm missing something or fooling myself into being happy with being single. And I must intentionally make myself turn towards what I consider to be the fruits of being single for me. I focus on the freedom that it gives me to live my life to my fullest integrity, to make my own best decisions on how to spend my time how to invest deeply in friendships with friends and family and community. I look for all those little things along the year that have brought me joy, that I'd call my good things, living in a simple downtown condo, 
studio that I, that I can walk everywhere, spending every Monday and Friday hiking up Rattlesnake Canyon with my dog, being reliably able to show up for friends and my cherished communities like this one, getting into getting many trips into the beloved mountains that I hold dear and to visit family I love who are far away and the time for my ample amounts of what I consider my sustenance, my daily feed to my spirit, being in the ocean, yoga, farmer's market, sleeping with the cats curled beside me. But there are also plenty of thoughts, feelings, perspectives, you could say, that challenge this that I must acknowledge, like imagining life would be richer with a partner to share it with, to make dreams happen together. Or the feeling that loneliness kind of creeps in on those nights and yearning for the intimate touch of another. I know I must acknowledge these discomforts to be open to feeling what comes up. The sadness, the loneliness, even the envy. For me, if I'm wanting peace in my head and my heart, I must train my mind to look for the good. If I turn my attention to what I'm learning, what's positive, what I'm contributing to, I feel empowered to move forward with a clear head. And this practice of turning toward the good positively affects me in the larger living in this complex world with all the very real suffering, hate, and seemingly unsolvable problems. When I hear a story of good action read from the Change for Good jar, it makes me feel like I can act and make a difference too. It brings me out of feeling stuck in the suffering of it. And I think I can do something to help this world too, just by my living. And there are other people out there doing amazing work I can follow or join. And this practice reminds me that I have the power of my own perspective and judgment of taking what I perceive and focusing on what's most helpful for me to clear my head and find presence. So it's easy to get caught up in the idea we need to make these big changes in order to be happy or that there's just one more thing out there I need to get or solve before I'm happy. Um, but for me, I've found it's practicing the small shifts in perspective that can illuminate the joy that's already there. And this brings me a sense of peace and completeness. So perhaps mom is right. In 2024, this will be the year I meet someone special and I'll get to enjoy the fruits of being in a relationship or not. Either way, I'm going to have a very good year. It's okay. How are we doing so far? Well, let's take a moment to just sit in silent meditation and think about the good things that you experienced in this past year, just a few. And as we head into this new year, uh, what will come will come and we'll deal with it. But looking back, I think we can all probably come up with many good things that would make that a year worth living. So just settle yourself and take a moment and think about the good things.
I don't have a problem speaking up here. <laughs> what the heck? It's a crazy flying pulpit. I've never figured out why does this belong in a Unitarian society. I don't know. I don't know. Well, uh, before I begin, uh, I do want to say that uh, I'm not big on uh, New Year's resolutions, but I do have two this year I want to share with you. Number one, and Anita's going to appreciate this, I'm going to start wearing those hearing aids that I bought two years ago. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the other one, though, <laughs> yeah, the other one is this coming year is going to be the year of parties. We're going to throw parties, and I encourage you to do the same. Okay, that's my uh, resolutions. So, I uh, just yesterday uh, read, uh, I think it was Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times, pointing out if we step back and look at the world in 2023 from a little distance, from a more of a mega level, a lot of good things happened. Number one, Child mortality hit a record low last year. About a million fewer babies died before the age of five last year than just in 2016. That's a good thing. Extreme poverty hit a record low around the world. 8% only 8% worldwide experienced extreme poverty last year. The medical breakthroughs that we saw in this past year are astonishing. New vaccines, polio is essentially now eradicated thanks so much to the efforts of Rotary International, actually, Bill, yeah, good work. The guinea worm that Jimmy Carter has battled against for so many years is actually being conquered. We're saving lives all over in Africa now by battling this terrible disease. There are some really great good things that are happening out in the world. I, uh, part of, I, I got another resolution for the new year, and that is, I allow people to help. I allow people to help. And I'm going to start right now. I have two people who are going to help me with this reflection. Anita Bloom and Linda Liker. Would you come up, please? They mentioned some good things that I just thought were so wonderful that you should hear it from their mouths, not mine. Okay. Hi. I'd say welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> Last Saturday, a week ago, I went shopping at Vaughn's on Turnpike. I recognized the woman sitting on the bench outside as I had talked to her before or basically listened to her before. Um, I was not certain if she was mentally ill or simply delayed. Um, she appeared to be around 50 and does like to talk to people. I interacted for about 15 minutes and excused myself to go shopping. I had noticed that she had a shopping list with some items on it. I didn't say anything. While I was inside shopping, I saw two teenage boys. They were 15, 16 years old. They had her shopping list. So I asked them if they were doing her shopping, and they were. Uh, so I, and they were very excited about it. I said, are you paying for the groceries? And they said, no, she gave us the money to buy the food. And we wanted to make sure she didn't buy anything she shouldn't have, like alcohol or cigarettes. I don't know how they thought they'd buy those, but that's neither here nor there. They wanted to be certain she had food. They told me she had been banned from the store, and they really cared. I almost started to cry. 
at their caring and told them how impressed I was with what they were doing. I did check with an employee and she really was banned from the store for being disruptive. They were great kids and must have great parents. I didn't ask their names and it restored my faith in humanity. Thank you. Um, we are 8 billion people on this planet. For the numerically challenged, that's 8,000 times a million. So every day, all over the world, people love their children and make sacrifices for them. They take care of their parents. They form communities and contribute to those communities. And they, um, what else do they do? <laughs> oh, and they, they uh, perform small acts of, innumerable small acts of kindness towards the people around them. This does not make the news. If I have a wish for this coming year, it's that we make a place in our hearts and in our collective consciousness for, all, for the acknowledgement of all the goodness and all the love of humanity. Thank you. See what I mean? Well, it all started when a 70-year-old fish market stall owner nicknamed Boogie was dancing in public in violation of Iranian law. Dressed in a white suit, I'm going to try to pronounce his real name, Sadeg Bana Motiyaded. You'll only hear it once. Energetically swayed and bopped as he serenaded the crowd with a folk song and encouraged others to join in with some joyous noise. A small group of men clapped around him, shouting back the rhythmic chorus, which was kind of a rap thing like, oh, 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 like this. A local DJ just happened to record the dance on his phone. A few days later, he posted a video of it on YouTube and Instagram. It immediately went viral. Suddenly, in cities across Iran, men and women of all ages began dancing, gyrating their hips, swirling their arms in the air as they chanted the song's catchy lines. Now, in most countries, dancing and singing in public is great. It's fine. It's not taboo. But in Iran, dancing in public, especially by women and between men and women, is banned. Although the rule is regularly defied, the enforcement could happen at any time. It's very arbitrary. In Iran, music, dancing, and singing are deeply rooted in their culture and attempts by the Islamic clerics to take that away over the past 43 years that they've been in control has by and large failed. It keeps popping up, right? But nonetheless, in this case, with the viral video, the authorities decided to arrest Boogie and the eight men who were grooving with him and then they began to crack down on people dancing to the video. Well, news of all of these arrests spread like wildfire and fueled outrage in the public. Many people posted angry messages on social media accusing the government of being at war with happiness. They said authorities were quick to round up citizens for no other crime 
than joy. In response to this, people mobilized, filming themselves dancing to the song everywhere, mimicking Booty's movements. They posted the videos on social media, calling it the happiness campaign. And today, a new form of protest against the government is rocking Iran. A viral dance craze set to an upbeat folk song where crowds clap and chant the rhythmic chorus. Oh, oh, oh. People are dancing in the streets, in shops, at sports stadiums, in classrooms, in malls, restaurants, gyms, parties, and everywhere where they congregate. This is right now. In Tehran, traffic was stopped in a major highway tunnel for an impromptu dance party. <laughs> Local newspapers ran front page stories questioning the wisdom of the crackdowns. And um, they said that it looks like it's all backfired and uh, with an embarrassing flouting of rules set down by the clerics themselves. And finally, the government had to give up. They retreated. Um, the police in the uh, Gilan province where Boogie did his dance they released him and the eight men. They released all of the other people that they had arrested for dancing. They re resurrected uh, Bodhi's uh, Instagram page. You know, it had a few thousand followers. Now it has over a million followers. And uh, Bodhi, the 70-year-old man, is now hailed by many Iranians as a national hero who inadvertently sparked a renewed call for joy and happiness. And it all started when this old man decided to dance. The loving spirit of humanity prevails. The arc of justice bends towards freedom. And I would say it bends towards happiness as well. So everybody rise as you are able and join us in this recognition of Iranian protest. Yeah, well now calling out around the world Are you ready for a brand new feat? Yeah, the winter's here and the time is right For dancing in the street They'll be dancing in Chicago In the street Yeah, down in New Orleans In the street Yeah, New York City Santa 
Okay, as, as we, we're going to leave this year behind. Not so bad after all, huh? Not so bad after all, but let's resolve to make this next year even better than last year. And uh, I think it all begins with kindness and dancing and more parties. And let's enjoy ourselves, right? Here's the key. <laughs> Blessing, call out a blessing, call out, call out a blessing, call out a blessing, call out a blessing, call out, call. Who's there? Hey, Catherine. Hey, I can hear you too. Hooray! Hi, Hi Kelly. Hi, Hi. Oh, how good you? to see you. It oh, is my you. goodness. Good to yes. see you, Mr. Lynn. Hello, everybody. Hey, Happy Jennifer. Happy Hi, Hi. 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 Hi